message from your word, and we hear it, and may it be applied to our hearts and lives. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, I want to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Genesis, chapter 18. Genesis 18. Genesis is the first book of the Old Testament and of the entire Bible. And this morning is now our eighth sermon in our series in Genesis that we are calling Blessed to be a Blessing. And in this series, we are zooming in with a microscope to the life of one man and one family, namely Abraham and his wife Sarah, whom God has called out of all the nations of the earth to enter into a covenant relationship with God. So that as God blesses Abraham and fulfills his promises in Abraham's life, all the nations of the earth might be blessed through him. We've walked through chapters 12, 15, and 17, in which the details of God's covenant of grace with Abraham are spelled out with great clarity. All that God was going to do in his life to bring about a people, a great nation from an offspring that Abraham and Sarah didn't even have yet to bring about a place that Abram's future offspring might inhabit, and most of all, to establish his presence with Abraham and all who, like Abraham, would walk by faith in the promise of the gospel. A people, a place, and God's presence. And what Abraham was called to do in response to all the promises that God would do is to mark his body with the covenant sign of circumcision a physical sign of a spiritual reality that numbered him and all who would follow him as those who belong to the people of God by faith. In last week's text, we saw God come and establish the time frame that within one year, that promised child would be conceived and born from Sarah's womb. For the first time in the narrative, Abraham and Sarah get insight into God's timing of his promises coming to pass. What they had waited 24 long years for was now within their reach. And yet God was not done teaching Abraham what he needed to learn as those promises came to be realized in his midst. Remember, Abraham's life was not the end game. Abraham was being blessed in order to be a blessing. And so as exciting as the birth of this promised child Isaac was going to be, it was not the end. It was simply the beginning. Like that wedding day that so many young couples look forward to and put all kinds of time and energy and money and effort into planning. And at some point they realize that as special as that day is, and it is a special day, It is only the beginning of the marriage that now, God willing, will last you for the rest of your life. And so chapters 18 and 19, they're like the premarital counseling, if you will. The big date for the big arrival has been set. And now Abraham needs to be prepared for what he's not prepared for yet. And God is going to come and teach him what was absolutely necessary for him to learn as that nation begins to come forth. Yes, starting with the life of Isaac, but would explode into a multitude of people so great that if you could number the sand on the seashore, if you could count the stars in the sky, then you would know the number of those who would be part of Abraham's offspring. And so now as we listen to the voice of God from the word of God for what scripture says, God says, wherever you're at this morning, the sanctuary, the lobby, the coffee house, or your homes, if you're able, I want to invite you to rise with me as we stand in attention to the voice of our God from his word, Genesis 18, verses 16 to 33. When the men got up to leave, they looked down towards Sodom, and Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way. Then the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he had promised. Then the Lord said, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sins so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. The men turned away and went toward Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham approached him and said, 
Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do what is right? The Lord said, if I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Then Abraham spoke up again. Now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes, what if the number of the righteous is five less than 50? Will you destroy the whole city because of five people? If I find 45 there, he said, I will not destroy it. Once again, he spoke to him. What if only 40 are found there? He said, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak. What if only 30 can be found there? He answered, if I, I will not do it if I find 30 there. Abraham said, now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, what if only 20 can be found there? He said, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then he said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak just once more. What if only 10 can be found there? He answered, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. When the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he left, and Abraham returned home. This is God's holy and inspired word for us today. Let's pray. Father, all scripture is breathed out by your Holy Spirit and is useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness that we may be equipped for every good work you have planned for us. You trained Abraham through your word, and we pray that you would train us this morning to be effective in your mission and for your glory. And we pray this in Christ's name and for his sake, and together we say, amen. Please be seated. Abraham, as the person through whom God would build for himself a great nation, had a lot he still needed to learn. And one of the most important things he needed to still learn is still today, one of the most important things that we need to learn, the relationship between our faith and our works, our faith and our obedience. Even today in the Christian church, this can so easily get messed up. It is what led to the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century, leading to the birth of the Protestant church. On one end of the spectrum, you get legalists who think of God as an angry army general you can never please, and therefore you better do everything right for God to both love you and continue to love you. On the other end of the spectrum, people think of God as an Easter Bunny, Santa Claus type figure who never gets angry, who functions more like a vending machine that you insert your prayers into and get out what you need. They think God wants me to be happy, and so whatever makes me happy, it must be God's will, God's design, God's desire. And so obedience or works, they're either everything to some or they're nothing to others. It's either faith plus works equals salvation, or it's faith equals salvation, and works are nowhere to be seen in the equation. And so God comes to Abraham in chapter 18 with the intent to show and teach him what he needs to learn in order to teach his children and those in his household, those who would be part of his lineage all the way down to you and I today. Verse 17, the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation. And all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? And the answer to God's rhetorical question is no. He was not going to hide it from Abraham. Abraham needed to see it with his own two eyes. So that Abraham and the nation that would come forth from Abraham would understand something critically important. Verse 19. For I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. Abraham is to teach his children and those in his household, those who are part of the covenant community, to keep the way of the Lord by living out righteousness and justice. And all of a sudden we see that the way God's people live matters. And it matters a great deal. 
But again, there's a proper relationship between faith and our obedience. And what we can never let go of is what we've already seen back in chapter 15, verse 6. That Abraham was justified. He was declared not guilty, having God's own righteousness credited to his account by faith alone in the promise of the gospel, period. Abraham did nothing to earn his salvation. And the Apostle Paul reiterates this in Romans 4, 5 when he says this, And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. We are justified by faith alone, in Christ alone, period. And yet our lives matter. The way we live matters. Our obedience matters as we are called to do righteousness and do justice. And what Abraham is about to see is what God will do when human beings made in his image choose to not walk in faith, but instead live in unrighteousness and sin. And so what we want to do, see in our text this morning, is that because God's judgment will certainly fall on the unrighteous, we must intercede for them and share the way of salvation. We'll develop this by looking first at God's judgment upon sin. Second, we'll see Abraham's intercession for Sodom. And third, we'll see the hope of escape. And so first this morning, let's look at God's judgment upon sin, everyone's favorite topic. Nothing offends the unsaved human heart more than a God who judges human sin. And unfortunately, that offense has also creeped into and continues to creep into the Christian church today. Immediately after God reveals to Abraham the call to keep the way of the Lord, he gives Abraham insight into what he is about to do. Verse 20. Then the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done all together according to the outcry that has come to me. And now Abraham sees the contrast between the call to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice and a city of people who have clearly done the opposite of that. And Abraham knows immediately what's going to result, that God is going to bring his judgment down on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, resulting in their destruction. And here we see the lesson for Abraham, a lesson that he is to teach to those who would follow him, that God will certainly judge the sin of human beings. Also for Abraham and the nation that would come forth from him if they choose to walk in the ways of Sodom rather than keep the ways of the Lord. Now two things that we see in regards to God's judgment on human sin in this passage. The first is that God is not unaware of any sin or wickedness on the earth within our lives. And that should cause all of us to take a deep gulp for a second. Nobody else may know what happens behind closed doors. The IRS may never figure out the numbers that are being fudged. There may not be a mind reader that lets people see your thoughts. But the outcry of sin rises loud and clear before the all-knowing sovereign God. And so first, God is aware of every sin on his earth but second, God's judgment upon that sin, it is often delayed, though it is certain to come. Sodom had been a wicked city for a very long time. And they would have laughed at a prophet who came and proclaimed that God's judgment was about to fall, saying, we've lived like this forever. God has never judged us. I think we'll, we'll stay the course. It took 120 years from when Noah began to build that ark until the rains began to fall. We could so easily trick ourselves into thinking that because God's judgment has not fallen upon sin in the moment, that it never will. Don't be fooled. God will judge every human heart, every action of our lives 
And though God's delay, what scripture often calls God's patience, is intended to lead us into repentance, at time, at some point, that patience is going to run out and his judgment will fall. Now, for those who have been wronged, who have been abused, those who have been mistreated or treated unjustly in this life, this can bring comfort to us. Though nobody else may know what has happened to you. Though your abuser, those who have done wrong to you are not public figures who garner national attention. The sovereign Lord knows. He sees. And in the end, his justice will be served. As Christians, this is why we're called to love and pray for our enemies, not to seek revenge on our own. Paul tells us in Romans 12, 19, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. In an ever-increasing secular world, the idea of a God who judges sin is an ever-increasing offense. Why? Because it's an authority issue. To bring judgment down is to declare that someone has not met a standard. They are guilty of doing or not doing something. You have not lived out biblical righteousness. You have not lived out biblical justice. You have not kept the way of the Lord. And in this world of self-determination, where people think we can just determine for ourselves what is right, what is good, a transcendent law of justice given by a transcendent lawgiver causes the world to hate that God and anyone who would uphold and proclaim his word. The world likes to proclaim, for example, love is love. 1 John 4, 8 says, God is love. And as the embodiment of love, he gets to tell us love's right expression. God's law reveals his truth for every area of our lives. As it is an expression of his good character. And it fits with how he has designed human flourishing to work in his world. It's why the Bible starts with, in the beginning, God, and everything else flows out of that reality. And for those who choose to live against God's good design and his law, because God is just, he will certainly judge all sin. See, God's judgment is in response to what our world's crying out for, God's justice. Biblical justice is living out God's commands in every relationship within our life. Human to human, human to God, human to creation. Biblical justice is living out God's 10 commandments in our everyday lives and relationships. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. How do you do that? The 10 commandments tell you exactly how to do that. God told Abraham, Keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. And when nations and people choose not to, when they choose to reject God and his word and walk in their own way, God's judgment, though delayed for a season, will certainly fall. Second this morning, let's see Abraham's intercession for the people of Sodom. Abraham was well aware of how wicked a place Sodom had become. The prophet Isaiah describes Sodom as a place of blatant indulgence in all kinds of iniquity. The prophet Jeremiah condemns its lying and adultery. The prophet Ezekiel condemns its pride, its excessive amounts of food and drink, and its prosperity by neglecting the poor. And in court, of course, in chapter 19, which I'm not reading for us this morning as the kids are in the service all summer. The city was most commonly known for its sexual perversions. And I'd encourage you to read chapter 19 later today. And yet Abraham knew that not everyone in the city was wicked for his nephew Lot and his family was living there. And so 
Abram begins this conversation, this intercession with God. The first prayer of intercession in the Bible and one of the most famous dialogues in the entire scriptures. And Abraham starts out being concerned for two things. Number one, the righteous, and number two, God's honor. Verse 23, will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? Big words. Again, Abraham is concerned for his righteous family, specifically Lot, whose story is very complicated, deserves a sermon on its own. His life could be described as a man who was a covenant member of the people of God, but was being allured and tempted by the ways of the world. Something we should all be weary of, especially living in a land as prosperous as this one. But Abraham was also concerned that if God were to destroy his own people, those who had been declared righteous by their faith in God's promises, that would bring dishonor upon God's name among the nations. Who would desire to be a part of God's people if he treated his people like that? The judge would be acting unjustly. But destroying the righteous was never part of God's plan. And in fact, though Abraham at this point is only concerned with the righteous, God's mercy bursts forth onto the scene. And in verse 26, he tells Abraham that if he can produce those 50 righteous people that Abraham himself had held out, not only would they be spared, of course, but on behalf of them, God would spare the whole city. The unrighteous because of the righteous. See, because God is just, all that he does is right. Abraham never had to worry that God was going to destroy the righteous. That would not be right. That would be unjust. That would be injustice. But God reveals here that often intertwined with his justice is his mercy. And though justice demands that every sin be paid for, every sin be punished, God here is holding out the possibility that on behalf of the righteous, sinners might be pardoned. Does that sound familiar? And then Abraham realizes that the number he threw out, 50, may be a little bit ambitious. <laughs> but now, in response to God's mercy, he begins to plead for the whole city. He begins to pray for the preserving of the righteous and the wicked alike. And so with great modesty, humility, and persistence, Abraham pleads that God would spare the city if a lower number of righteous people could be found. 45? Yes. 40? Yes. God, don't be angry, but 30? Yes. Lord, I know I am but dust and ash, but 20? Yes. Father, forgive me one more time, but 10? Yes. God says in verse 32, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. Now, who knows what Abraham's thinking at this point? But he knew Lot was there and his wife and their two daughters and their two sons-in-law to be that six. There had to be four more, right? Right? No. Some people think this passage is an example about how human beings can change God's mind. I don't think that's the right interpretation of this passage or any passage. Rather, I think God is putting on display for Abraham and for us that he is both just and merciful. And that because God is a God of justice, everything he does is right. And so later in chapter 19, when his judgment falls, he doesn't destroy the righteous with the guilty, but he does destroy the guilty. It's a heavy passage. And it's the part of God's character we've all but lost in our secular culture today. 
that when the judge of all the earth does what is right, does what is just, Sodom got destroyed. Now, Abraham was deeply aware of their standing before God. And in great love and concern, he pleads on their behalf in prayer. And as Christians, living in a world as depraved as Sodom, the calling upon our life is to intercede both in prayer, but also with the words and actions of our life for those who still sit under judgment. God is still being patient. There is still time for repentance. But at some point, the rains began to fall. At some point, Sodom got destroyed. Do not delay, but recognize the urgency of the call. Finally this morning, let's see the hope of escape, the salvation of our God. This passage is a weighty passage. It could have so much more said about it than what I can say in 30 minutes. But two things that I think are equally clear and brought to the forefront. The first we've already mentioned is the certainty that God will judge every sin, though his delay in that judgment is often extensive. It's often lengthy. The apostle Peter, when he wrote his second letter, he reflects back on how God has judged human sin in the past to remind his readers in the present and us today of the certainty of what is going to come in the future. The weeds aren't going to get pulled out amidst the wheat today. They will grow up together today. But the day of judgment is certain to come. 2 Peter 2.4. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, And if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. See, God will rescue the godly those who have been declared righteous by faith. But his judgment is equally certain to fall on the guilty. But the second reality that this passage makes clear is that God is willing to be merciful to sinners on behalf of the righteous. And the good news of the gospel, the hope for all people who are living in a world as equally depraved as Sodom was then, is that we don't need to find 50, 40, 30, 20, or even 10 righteous people. But we need to look to the one righteous God-man, Jesus the Christ, who has made it so that not just a city, but all nations might escape the judgment and find salvation. 1 Peter 3.18 says this, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Friends, there is a way for the unrighteous to be made right with God, and that is through faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ, who has kept the way of the Lord perfectly, who has walked in righteousness perfectly, who has lived out justice perfectly, and then humbly laid his life down on a cross and died for the sin of the unrighteous. So that God would be both just in having his son pay for sin and merciful as he was the justifier of all those who put their trust in him. And now that God calls us to keep the way of the Lord, not to earn anything from God, 
but as a response of gratitude for the grace and salvation we have received. A dying world does not want to hear about a God who judges sin. But the worst thing we could ever do is see someone standing in the second story of their home when their lower level is on fire and smile and say nothing. Don't tell a dying world that everything is okay. Don't capitulate to culture and join in the anthem that evil is good and good is evil. But keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness, by living out biblical justice, and by calling people to cling with you to the gospel of Jesus. Let's pray. Oh Lord, these are heavy words from your word today. We'd so much rather think about love and grace than judgment and justice. And yet your love and grace only find meaning for us. They only delight our soul as we come to see your glory, our sin and your redemption bought by your son. May our hearts be captivated by a good, righteous and just God who has shown us mercy and grace in your son. And may we cling to him day after day. We pray this in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Wow. Um, I was thinking about what Brad started with. The idea that there's those who tend toward license.